calls for diplomacy in Ukraine get the cold shoulder, when all they are saying is give peace talks a chance. Qatar and World Cup 2022. The PR games are well underway. And politics and tourism intersect online. The influencers on tour in Syria. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. We're eight months into the war in Ukraine, and navigating through the news output is not getting any easier. Just a few weeks ago, Western news consumers were seeing reports of Ukrainian counteroffensives, pushing Russian forces to the brink of defeat. What has followed has been the heaviest Russian air campaign since the war began. Waves of missile strikes that have crippled power plants, water facilities, and hit hospitals. If that initial coverage was misleading, other reporting on the missiles that hit Poland has been downright dangerous. News outlets parroting allegations that those missiles were Russian led to some politicians calling for NATO to get involved. It turns out the missiles were Ukrainian. And there are more and more hints coming out of Washington that it's time to bring the diplomats in to try to end this war. But for some U.S. news outlets, like their Russian counterparts, diplomacy has somehow become a dirty word. Our starting point this week is the war in Ukraine. Tonight, Ukrainians reeling from a relentless Russian missile barrage. News consumers have good reason to be confused by the reports coming out of Ukraine. Lots of the country without power, often enough without water. Because this past week, Russia launched a series of strikes targeting Ukraine's infrastructure, leaving an estimated 10 million people without power as winter sets in. What happened to that other storyline that got so much play just a few weeks ago? Kherson was taken by Russia early on in the war, and its recapture by Ukraine is a major strategic blow for the Kremlin. The narrative that had Russian forces retreating from places like Kherson, allegedly in disarray. Moreover, in this week's attacks, the Russian military relied on the same weapons that Western news audiences had been told Russia was running out of. The fog of war grows thicker, the truth harder to find. We need to be quite skeptical of the information that we're pre being presented in all of this. For example, um, we've been told for months, months, that the Russians uh, are you know, running out of missiles and other munitions. A senior U.S. official is telling CNN the Kremlin is struggling to maintain its arsenal of high-tech weapons and missiles. But just last week, we saw the Russians launch the largest barrage of missile attacks on Ukraine since the start of the war. So something doesn't add up uh, between what we're seeing on the battlefield and the claims that we see in a lot of the media coverage on this. The longer this war goes on and the more desperate that the Russian military gets, the more they're going to resort to increasingly destructive and indiscriminate measures uh, that will make ordinary Ukrainian people suffer. Wars go back and forth. There's, there's offensives, counter-offensives, counter-counter-offensives. And given the uncertainty around what exactly the battlefield reality actually is, uh, I think that points the need to try and find a way to end this war and, and find some sort of peace that's at least sustainable, uh, even if it's not the ideal situation for either party in this war. Misinformation or substandard journalism, wherever the motivation lies, does not get much more dangerous than what came out of the Associated Press on November 15th, the day two missiles landed on Polish territory, killing two people. The AP quoted a single anonymous U.S. intelligence source, saying the missiles were Russian. By the time officials from both the Polish government and NATO made clear the missiles were probably Ukrainian and had veered off course, AP's story had traveled across other news outlets. Poland is a NATO country. NATO has clauses in its constitution that stipulate when any of its member states are attacked, other NATO countries are treaty bound to come to its defense. That story, AP's handling of it, risked something NATO countries insist they do not want, an escalation, a widening of this war. The lesson is, of course, uh, to be uh, very responsible and not to be driven by uh, confirmation uh, bias, um, especially now at the heat of the uh, conflict. There was just one source, 
uh, it uh, uh, should have activated alarm bells in the minds of the editors. Uh, but that uh, didn't happen because everybody were expecting Russia to do something like that. We need to be quite cautious about how the media portray these kinds of incidents. The missile incident in Poland, the Nord Stream 2 attack, there's not a lot of direct evidence about what has gone on there. And we, we need to be careful that uh, the narratives that are being pushed by the information warriors don't precipitate some sort of confrontation between the United States and Russia that could lead to very dangerous escalation. AP acknowledged its failings the day after the story came out, issuing a correction, saying its anonymous source was wrong. Five days after that, it fired the reporter responsible. The escalation narrative gets plenty of play on the Russian airwaves, thanks to bellicose voices like Vladimir Solovyov of the state-owned channel Rossiya One. However, more and more criticism is now being directed at the Russian military and its leaders for failures on the battlefield. Anchors and commentators still see a red line they will not cross at the Kremlin. They do not dare criticize President Putin. So they've taken to complaining about the editorial restraints the Kremlin has imposed on them, hemming them in editorially on stories such as the Russian retreat from Kherson. The Kremlin itself is not homogeneous. It is common in the in Russian analysis to um, to talk about the um, uh, com competing. Uh, towers of the Kremlin, one tower fighting another, and that is reflected in the media. This fight of the bulldogs, you can see it on, on Russian television channels and uh, also on Telegram channels. Russian media don't know uh, in which uh, direction they should go. Confusing signals have been coming out of Washington as well. On November 9th, the U.S.'s top military officer, General Mark Milley, went against the White House's official line, saying that since neither Russia nor Ukraine can hope to achieve a military victory, the time had come for diplomacy, peace talks, which signals a significant turn. Just last month, when 30 members of U.S. Congress, progressive Democrats, quietly sent a letter to President Biden calling for negotiations, the blowback, much of it on social media, was so bad that the letter was withdrawn that same day. The group's leader felt compelled to offer a clarification. Every war ends with diplomacy, she said, and this one will too, after a Ukrainian victory. Nobody in Washington wants to be labeled as soft on Russia or somehow sympathetic toward Putin, and we saw that play out in the media coverage. The reaction was ironic because very shortly after the letter was retracted, we learned that the national security advisor to uh, President Biden, Jake Sullivan, has in fact been talking to the Ukrainians about the possibility of negotiations. He's been talking to senior advisors to President Putin. And Western establishment and part of the uh, media community in the West uh, is um, uh, so invested in this conflict, they dismiss diplomacy. That President Putin has perpetrated um, and sponsored and ordered by his military atrocities, war crimes, make him unsuitable for any kind of a conversation between the... They um, see it as uh, heresy. But then if we are in, in this real situation where Russia is uh, at least for now, is simply stronger. So it's not looking like the Russian political regime is uh, going to collapse in, in the near future. 
Um, so why not uh, talk about diplomacy? It also speaks to the role that the media unfortunately has played uh, throughout this war, which is to, to egg on the Biden administration uh, to be more aggressive, more escalatory, uh, to get deeper involved in the conflict. What about offensive weapons? I mean, being able to disrupt, intercept, shoot down Russian incoming is one thing, but we sure. know the Ukrainians want advanced rocket systems, advanced missiles. A lot of the news coverage of this war has taken on some of the worst characteristics of Cold War reporting. Uh, and by the way, how did the Cold War end? Uh, it ended through years, if not decades, of talks. The Cold War made us realize the importance of talking to one's adversary, to one's enemy even, uh, especially if that adversary is a hugely powerful country that's sitting on thousands of nuclear warheads. And some of that thinking has been lost today, I think. So much has been said and reported since the World Cup opened in Qatar last week. Johanna Hoos is in Doha with a look at some of the international coverage. Well, Richard, Doha put on a spectacular opening ceremony featuring Hollywood stars and a recitation of the Quran in the first World Cup held here in the Middle East. However, a narrative that has remained in some international media is the one about the suitability of Qatar as a host country for the tournament. Britain's BBC, for instance, chose not to broadcast the opening ceremony and focused on rights instead, discussing labor and LGBTQ issues. FIFA sent out a letter to all the teams, didn't they, saying stick to football. And we'd love to. We really would. <laughs> but it's not possible, is it, Alan? That led to some pointing out that Qatar is being exceptionalised compared to other World Cups or Olympic Games. These kind of ramming politics into uh, sports and using that kind of very high moralistic tone is only reserved uh, for other countries. It's never applied uh, uh, to European countries. Nine months ago, Beijing hosted the Winter Olympics and the BBC broadcast the opening ceremony despite China being accused by multiple countries of acts of genocide in Xinjiang province. In challenging some of the questions raised about its rights record and other matters, Qatar has an entire media network, Al Jazeera, on hand. A lot of people have perceptions of the, um, or ideas about the Middle East. Do you think the World Cup is a chance to change that? Absolutely. The English and Arabic news channels have devoted a lot of airtime to covering and even celebrating the World Cup despite some of its controversies. Covering the first World Cup in the Arab world has proven to be an interesting assignment for TV journalists from Israel as well. From which uh, TV you are? We're from Israel. Sorry. Israeli journalists are seeing firsthand that despite the commitments of so-called normalized relations across the region, many Arabs on the street continue to protest the occupation of Palestine. One week down, three to go. Qatar has invested an estimated $250 billion into this tournament and along with competing teams on the pitch, there are competing narratives of it. Thanks, Joe. Elsewhere in the Middle East, Turkey, Israel and Russia have all been bombing various targets in Syria, a reminder that peace there is still a long way off. It was 11 years ago during the Arab Spring that citizens first took to the Syrian streets, peaceful demonstrations against the rule of President Bashar al-Assad. They were met with violence and brutality. Today, against long odds and with a little help from some powerful friends, Assad remains in power and other governments are slowly, quietly, re-establishing relations. In fact, anyone browsing travel content on social media would be forgiven for thinking that normalization was already a done deal. Foreign travel vloggers have been visiting Damascus for years, and more recently, they've even ventured into territory that had been under opposition control and was bombed accordingly by Syrian and Russian forces. The Listening Post's Ahmed Mahdi now on the curious world of travel vlogging and what looks like a victory lap for the Assad regime. Friday was the bloodiest day in a month of protests in Syria for crimes against humanity. For more than 10 years now, the headlines coming out of Syria have depicted dictatorship. This is the war Bashar Assad is waging on his own people. Death. Nearly 12,000 children have been killed or injured. And destruction. Entire neighborhoods lie destroyed. An apocalyptic scene. But in one corner of the internet, you can see a very different side to Syria.
I love Syria and you will not believe how amazing it is. I tried so long. Good evening guys. Right now I'm in Damascus. Thanks to some unlikely visitors. I first heard about travel bloggers to Syria post-war uh, in 2019. Good morning guys and welcome to Damascus, Syria. I didn't know what to expect from Damascus really, but this, this wasn't really it. Like it, just, it feels like any other nice touristy city. It was amazing to see Damascus again. That's where my mom lived for quite some time. And as a Syrian, I got very emotional seeing that footage and seeing Bakdash. It was absolutely amazing. Seeing her eating the ice cream and they give it to her for free. But mostly I remember being kind of shocked that they were doing that already. This is a Syrian stamp. The travel vloggers were already heading to Syria as a travel destination. We are in Japan, guys. Another beautiful sunny day here in Barbados. Travel vlogging is a huge online industry. And to stand out, many vloggers have been visiting so-called alternative travel destinations. The kind more often seen in the headlines than the travel brochures. Unbelievable. It's a winning formula and it's generated millions of views and dollars for both the content creators and the social media companies. I was just so hyped on all the positive things about Syria. The people, the food, the love. But in a place like Syria, is this content cutting corners with the truth just to please the algorithms? You know, when there's a war, it's not raining bombs on every single inch of Syria. People are still living there. My family is still there. They still, you know, go to work every day. But this very simplistic view of life in Syria lacks nuance of how life actually is inside a war. These streets that I saw in the videos are, are real, but they're very touristy. Syria is very big and it's not one, one neighborhood or or one very Instagrammable street. We just stopped for a photo of that. Look at that. We asked the Syrian Tourism Ministry whether foreign travel influencers were being invited into the country for PR purposes. They didn't respond. What we do know is that every tourist visiting Syria, travel vloggers included, is legally required to be accompanied at all times by a government-approved guide, what journalists would call a handler. So, while vloggers are exploring the markets of Damascus, oh my God. So good. roaming the ruins of Aleppo, or chatting to locals in Tartus. You, Ahmed? Uh, Ahmed. I'm Mohammed. 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 The eyes and ears of the government are never far away. Dawood Afunzada knows this firsthand. He's a travel vlogger who just returned from Syria a few weeks ago. Of course, I had to get a guide. You cannot just wander around yourself as a tourist with a touristic visa in Syria. I'm here with my guide, Mary. Hi. Hi. So what the guides do after you leave the country, they're reporting it to the government. Where have you been and what you have done in the country? This is the real nightlife of Syria as of now. Check this out. I was there during the Christmas time. People were having fun in the cafes, having shisha. So this is one of the videos I shared as well. But I also shared other part of it, the leftovers from the civil war. Do you want to see what civil war brings to the country? Right now I'm in Syria, in the biggest city called Homs. And all around me is just destroyed buildings. I think people, specifically Syrians, had very mixed feelings about my content. They were thinking that I am sold out and I am, it's a propaganda for the government and I'm actually paid to be in Syria and make this content, which is absolutely not true. Syria is not only about civil war and depressing headlines. Hey Davood, fun fact, on Christmas Day, the same day you posted that regime-sponsored propaganda, six opposition fighters were murdered in northern Syria. One of the reasons why I made that TikTok about Davood is he specifically made a video of some destroyed buildings and his messaging was, see what war gets you, it gets you nothing. As a result, this is what we have left. Which to me was very heart-wrenching. There are results of the war with the regime. Every travel vlogger I'm aware of says, well, I'm not political. And, but how can you show the destruction of a political war and still be apolitical? When you go into a war zone and say it's apolitical, it's only documentation, and you're showing only one side, then if you're documenting, you should actually do more research and more work and go to places where you, know, you don't have a fixer from 
the side of the regime showing you around. This is a very political space you're standing in that is under regime control, and the regime is showing you what they want the world to know. Part of the problem is that journalists are not being allowed in, except for media from countries the regime considers friendly, like Russia and Iran, states that have backed President Bashar al-Assad. Few foreign reporters have been able to visit government-held Syria in recent years. That's left the vloggers and other more controversial figures to fill the information gap. Blurring the lines between content creator and journalist. There was an army created inside Syria, which they called themselves Free Army, and they were fighting against Syrian government. I'm not a journalist, I'm just a simple content creator. And I feel like people uh, right now trust individuals and the content creators more than the news. What I wanted to do is just uh, show a little bit different side and more authentic side of Syria. Syria will become and as a very important destination for the region and for the touristic destination as well. And I do feel like the content I share helps it a little bit. Despite the ongoing fighting, the millions of Syrians displaced, and the fact that around a third of the country remains beyond his control, Assad is ready to reintroduce himself to the world. States that had once denounced his rule are now resuming diplomatic ties and along with it, lucrative energy and trade deals. For the global news audience, however, it's a much harder sell. And that's why the regime needs all the help it can get. When you have 10 years of, of conflict, afterwards comes you know, the writing history part, the normalization with the world part. These vloggers are a very small part of this plan. I personally don't think that Tourism right now in Syria is ethical. It is only aiding the bigger message that the regime wants to come across, which is that Syria is safe. Syria is not safe, especially not for Syrians who want to return. Every Syrian wants the world to hear and to see Syria as they know it, as this beautiful, historical, magical place. And in that sense, who can blame the travel vloggers for wanting to tell that story? But this tourism without journalism is mostly harmful. I want the story of Syria to be told, but I want the whole story told. And finally, the Pakistani film Joyland and the continuing drama around it. Two months ago, Joyland was submitted as Pakistan's official entry for the Academy Awards. Then, after complaints from the leader of a religious party, it was banned in Pakistan. Then it was cleared and allowed back into cinemas, but only after certain scenes had been cut. Joyland is about a love affair between a man and a transgender woman. It is not the first film to get this kind of treatment from the country's censors. That point has been made on social media, where Pakistanis have been posting lists of other films that have been either banned or censored, films that the authorities in Islamabad are no fans of. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Uncle, you can't get a shop. 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 You can't get a shop